morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, our probably over 80th annual uh, Langdon Research Extension Center annual field day. And of course, uh, we do this in conjunction with the Northern Canola Growers Association, and we appreciate that partnership. And uh, of course, uh, this year uh, with the pandemic issue, uh, we're choosing a different format to deliver field days to you this year. And typically what we would do is we'd uh, recruit about 10 to 15 speakers, go out into the field, and each speaker would speak about 15 minutes. Uh, we'd allow a little bit of time for questions and then move on to the next uh, stop. And typically that was about a four to five hour field day. But today we still have the 10 to 14 speakers uh, that uh, recorded videos. And the format's gonna be a little bit different because I guess in video uh, IT uh, uh, etiquette, uh, we don't want our videos to go much more than five minutes or we lose the attention of the audience. So our speakers have put together some videos that run anywhere from three to six minutes. Uh, and uh, if you add up all those uh, uh, videos, uh, we should be here about an hour to an hour and a half. So it will be a little bit of a, a, a scaled down field day compared to if we were able to do it face to face. But nevertheless, uh, NDSU knows how important it is to get the information our, out to our growers. And uh, uh, therefore, we've put together this virtual field day for you. And just let me uh, explain how this is going to work. Uh, we've got several speakers with their videos. And I'm going to introduce each video prior to the video being played. And uh, we have two options to be able to uh, interact uh, with, the, with the speaker. First of all, you can click the chat box and uh, uh, type in your question uh, in the chat box anytime you feel uh, you'd like to ask a question. Or uh, at the end of the video, you can unmute yourself and ask a question verbally. So uh, that's kind of the format that we're going to be following. And uh, so I think what we'll do is uh, I think we'll start out. Uh, we've got three introductory videos. Uh, we've got uh, NDSU president, Dr. Gershani. And we've got uh, Dr. Greg Lardy, uh, who is the director of the Extension Service, director of the Ag Experiment Station, and also dean of the College of Ag and Food Systems and Natural Resources. Uh, we'll be giving a, uh, uh, a, a short uh, a welcome uh, video, uh, along with Barry Coleman, uh, the executive director of the Northern Canola Growers Association. So I think what we'll do right now is we'll play uh, the three welcome videos, and uh, uh, I don't anticipate too many questions from them, but we do have several speakers uh, that are being showcased today that are on uh, this call. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer those questions for you. If we can't, we certainly will find the answers and follow up for you. So why don't we start with a, a welcome from Dr. Pres or Dr. Brishani, president of NDSU. Uh, Randy, uh, Dr. Lardy would like to say a few words live before we play the videos. So, that, Thank you, Zayim, for uh, chiming in. And Dr. Lardy, uh, uh, welcome, and we're happy to have you here. And uh, go ahead and uh, give us your spiel there. Well, Randy, Randy good morning, and uh, thanks, thanks, everyone, for joining us here at the uh, Langdon Virtual Field Day. I, I want to start out just by uh, thanking all of our staff uh, at the at the research center and the county extension staff that's on the line, you know the last several months with the pandemic have been quite challenging, and we've asked our staff to make numerous adjustments in terms of how they uh, do business and conduct their research programs, how they conduct extension programming, and they've just performed uh, so admirably through this whole uh, pandemic, and so we're very. Uh, thankful for all of the things that uh, they've been able to do and, and the adjust adjustments that they've made in uh, delivering, continuing to deliver very high quality programs. So Randy, a shout out to you and your staff here at Langdon for putting this together this morning. I also wanna thank our advisory board members that are on the line today. Uh, thank them for their service and the work that they're doing to help guide uh, the activities at Langdon and the research and extension programs that go on there. And I also want to give a thank you to the support that we've had from our legislators for uh, the, the various programs and our agencies that uh, uh, we really depend on their support to appropriate uh, money so we can continue to carry out the excellent work that uh, 
that's being conducted. And so on behalf of uh, my office and uh, all of our administrative staff here, Andy, I want to welcome everyone to your field day. And, and uh, I'm going to jump off here in just a couple minutes and, and get on a, a COVID-related call with another group. Uh, but just wanted to join you for a few minutes here this morning live and, and say thank you to the staff and and uh, just give a shout out to, to all the efforts that they've made to make adjustments here over the last several months. It's been uh, challenging times, but uh, we're coming through it in, in admirable fashion. So, Randy, with that, I'll turn it back over to Naeem. Okay, message well received. Thank you, Dr. Lardy. And I think, Naeem, now we'll go ahead and play the three welcome videos. Thank you. Well, welcome to Field Days 2020. Now, admittedly, I'm not at Field Days and you may not be either, but we are here in the agricultural plots to the west of the Agricultural Research Greenhouse Facility, obviously, hard at work for you. What we do at NDSU is measured by one simple thing, your success. And we want you to be as successful as possible because the state needs you to be successful as possible. You are our state's tradition. You are our state's history. You are the basis of our state's economy. And that's what NDSU is about, helping you be successful so that our state is successful and all the citizens we serve thrive as a result. Thanks for everything you do. I'm sorry I'm not there, but obviously uh, the Fargo area is one of the still hotbeds for the virus and we didn't want to put you at risk by people from Fargo coming to you. So we're doing the next best thing. Thanks a lot. Go Bison. Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Lardy, and I'm currently serving as Vice President for Agricultural Affairs here at NDSU. On behalf of all of our faculty, staff, and scientists throughout our entire system, I want to welcome you to the 2020 Field Days. With the pandemic, we've had to pivot and create these virtual field days, uh, as many of you have in your production schemes as well. Uh, we certainly want to thank you for your patience as we've developed these programs. I'm standing here in a field north of 19th Avenue in Fargo, and in the background you can see our new veterinary diagnostic laboratory. We want to give a special thank you to our North Dakota legislature for their support of all of our ag research and extension projects that they've funded throughout the past couple of bienniums. We're certainly proud of the agricultural heritage that we have, and I want to give a special thank you to all of our faculty, staff, and scientists who've worked hard through the pandemic to continue to deliver top quality research and extension programs to our constituents. These virtual field days will give you a chance to connect to a variety of different research projects that are going on across our system. We're proud of the local research that our Research Extension Center Network does and the connections that they have to our main campus scientists. On behalf of all of our faculty and staff, welcome to the 2020 field days. And on behalf of everyone, thank you for attending. Hi, this is Barry Coleman of the Northern Canola Growers Association. Thank you for attending this year's tour. The Northern Canola Growers Association has a broad representation of board members from across the state who work hard representing the industry. We allocate over $300,000 in annual research funding to strengthen the canola crop in this region. Much of the research focus has been on disease identification and control, insect management, hybrid development specific to our growing region, finding new uses for canola oil and improving management and stand establishment. Now the past few years have been challenging for agriculture due to the low prices for commodities. We had the market facilitation program for two years which has now been replaced by the coronavirus food assistance program or CFAP and the canola industry is fortunate in this regard as canola has been included in this program unlike the USDA shutout of our crop as well as many other crops from the market facilitation program from prior years. We're providing input to Senator Hoven on the continued need for assistance in the way price supports for the 2020 crop year. The CFAP announced in May of this year did provide over $17 million to the canola industry. Now this came out to about $9 an acre. And while those in agriculture are certainly appreciative of this support for, for agriculture at this time, uh, it's far short of what is needed for um, the problem of low prices this year. 
This is based off of the USDA calculating the drop in canola price from January to April of this year and then um, applying a, a reduction factor on that uh, when determining how much money would be allocated to growers. The egg industry has been told that the reason for the reduction of the funds was that USDA was limited by the funds they had available in the CCC, therefore the amounts needed to be reduced. This points to the need for more assistance from the USDA and Senator Hoven's office has indicated they do indeed intend to provide more assistance. We should be hearing more in the next few weeks from the Senate on, in this regard. And the NCJ will continue to provide any information needed to ensure that canola gets its fair share of assistance from any future programs. Now, in addition to the CFAP program, the NCJ predicts that canola PLC payments for this year will reach the highest levels ever. Total payments will likely exceed $90 million for the canola industry. Now, North Dakota has 1.35 million base acres of canola in the program, which represents about 95% of the total uh, canola base acres in the country. Average payments for these base acres is uh, roughly $74 an acre. And we worked closely many years ago with the U.S. Canola Association and other canola growers from other states to ensure that canola was included in this important price support program. And it continues to provide needed financial support to canola growers in a decoupled manner. So our working with other allies and other canola growers and other regions of the country certainly paid dividends in that regard to this program. Now, some other issues that the NCG has been working on are getting canola eligible for inclusion in renewable diesel. Back when the biodiesel program was started over a decade ago, it was found that canola met the life cycle analysis for biodiesel, but not the th higher threshold that was in place at the time for renewable diesel. Now, at the time, there was no company in the U.S. even contemplating renewable diesel production. There was nothing in the works much less RD production using canola oil. So at the time it was decided to um, go ahead with the analysis that had been uh, looked at by the EPA and just uh, have canola approved for biodiesel use. Um, now that uh, you know, EPA assured us that they would, would likely okay it in time, but they haven't. So now there's an ongoing shift in the biofuels market towards more renewable diesel production. Uh, production of renewable diesel has been up more than 46% in the last year alone. So we've asked the EPA to complete its assessment that they've had uh, on their desk for the last decade and, and, and complete that analysis, which we believe will show that canola oil meets the higher threshold to be included as an eligible feedstock for renewable diesel production. Now this would allow a local source of renewable diesel production in North Dakota, the plant in South Hart, for instance, to be able to add canola oil to its list of eligible commodities that could be used. And this would fit well with our target objective of finding new uses for canola oil. Finally, we hope by this winter that things will return to normal and we plan on having our 23rd annual Canola Expo in Langdon on Tuesday, December 8th. And as always, we encourage growers who want to become members of the association to just log on to our website at northerncanola.com where you can uh, click on a, a website uh, link to become a member of the association. We look forward to seeing you at our Canola Expo in Langdon on Tuesday, December 8th. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, President Prashani, President, or Dr. Lardy, and uh, Barry Coleman for those uh, welcomes. And I do want to just add that uh, uh, we do really treasure that relationship with the Northern Canola Growers Association. We've worked hand in hand together uh, for many, for decades, and uh, we really appreciate that relationship. And uh, so with that, let's uh, get into the meat of the uh, program here. We've got about 10 videos that we'd like to share with you uh, that address different issues regarding agriculture. And what we're going to start out with is uh, our uh, plant pathologist here at Langdon, Dr. Venkat Chapara, uh, will be giving an update on the 2020 canola, canola disease update. So let's... Uh, Hear from Venkat. Hello all, I'm Venkat Chapra, plant pathologist at here in Langdon Research Experiment Station. I'm here for the past five years. I work on a lot of diseases, but today a lot of diseases and a lot of crops, but today I will be updating you guys on uh, Duke, the research has been done on canola diseases. 
To list, we have three prominent diseases in North Dakota on canola uh, causing losses. Uh, one, black leg, second, white mold, followed by, in a small pa part of the state, we have club root. Even though it is very minor in our area, in, a, in a North Dakota, when you come to our area in Northeast North Dakota, it's a big thing. So I'll be updating uh, the research which we did uh, over the years or last year uh, on all three of these diseases. Coming to black leg, you know, it is caused by a fungus and uh, so it has been a uh, lot of research has been done by the NDSU pathologists over here and we have a lot of um, information on it. The, for, for you guys to remember that every year when you choose your variety, pick um, black leg resistant varieties based on the pathogenicity groups you have in your area. Uh, also remember to follow longer crop rotations and rotate the varieties with different pathogenetic groups that are available uh, in canola crop. The second disease which I wanted to focus is white mold. Uh, it is common in our area every year and we have in NDSU uh, very good forecasting system. Follow that, it's a weekly update. Uh, it is published in crop, uh, crop and pest report every week follow the um, guidelines and see whether you are your or your canola crop is susceptible to this disease and don't forget at 20 percent of flowering we need one fungicidal application there are quite a few fungicides available to manage this disease uh, to, to to want if you guys wanted to know we have been producing these annual reports every year you can check what uh, what are the latest chemicals and how they are faring and also you can check ndsu fungicide drug field crop fungicide drug guide for the appropriate chemical and the dosages etc and the and the final and the last disease i'm going to talk about is club root Club root has been uh, identified in uh, North Dakota in the year 2013. Since then, it has been a regular citation in our canola fields over the years. Over the past five years, we have been um, surveying, and uh, every year it has been a common occurrence in canola in this part of the North Dakota. Over the um, out of uh, out of all the years we surveyed. 2018, we had a very, very large impact of club root in our area. Uh, out of 100 fields with, uh, we surveyed, 33 fields were infected with club root. So we wanted to take immediate measures and there were a lot of uh, educational programs has been. And the, by 2019, we found only four fields in our county out of the 50 fields we, uh, we scouted. Good thing that everybody is uh, opting for a resistant variety, which is um, readily available to our growers, but there are very few varieties available. We don't have an option like uh, what we have in black leg. There are a number of varieties. You can rotate the varieties. Here with club root, we have only very few varieties. The rotation of the varieties may not work, but along with that, you should practice other practices too. If you have club root in your field, follow sanitization of your equipment. Follow longer crop rotations. That is one canola crop in three years. Then use resistant varieties if you have the history of club root in your field. The varieties we have listed in our website and in the annual reports which are available to the growers. We are trying to keep track of the pathotypes in our area. This is the table you will be finding um, in the reference section where we have very primitive pathotypes which have been observed in our area. So all the resistant varieties which are available can control the pathotypes which are prevalent in our area. We are doing more studies on the pathotype and its prevalence. Hopefully we can get, I can get a very um, uh, valuable data by next year. Uh, keep fingers crossed and good luck for you guys for this cropping season. Thank you for watching.
thank you, Dr. Chapara. Now, again, I just would like to remind everybody that if you have a question, you can either use the chat box or if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask a question, uh, we can address that. Um, hello, all. Uh, thank you for watching my talk. And I have a, I'm ready to accept any questions if you guys have. Uh, the thing I wanted to know is uh, like, uh, the, uh, inform you guys one more thing is that we are doing statewide soil samples uh, collections. Uh, we are we wanted to see how lo how long the um, club root has spread from our county to different counties. So for that, I, all I need is half a pound to pound sample from your field. There is a brochure we are, we have on website. Follow the guidelines and send me the samples. Will be good. We can manage this disease a lot better than other countries have done. Any other questions? Yeah, um, I guess I do have one question, uh, Venkat. Could you just really briefly, uh, we're getting into where peak flowering now with canola and it's going to start maturing. Could you just give our participants a little idea of what to look for or how to identify it visually? Yeah, that's a good thing, uh, Randy. Uh, Randy himself has ob observed a huge patches uh, on one of the canola field right uh, close to research center. And we had the history of um, club root in that field. So if you guys any, have seen any patches, huge patches, uh, dead patches in your canola crop, please inform us. I will I'll be, or I will, our crew will be coming and collecting soil samples to diagnose and, uh, you know, the, if you have club root and we can come up with what is the pH in your soil, what is the pathotype in your soil and uh, how much of uh, spores load is in your uh, field. So that we, by that, if you have high spore load, we would uh, recommend longer crop rotations. If you have lesser spore load, we can uh, uh, lessen the crop rotation length. Like, uh, you know, if you give one crop in three years, that will be enough. And uh, be sure that uh, every year after your in, uh, uh, standard length of rotation, go for club root resistant variety. All right, thank you, Venkat. Uh, any other questions? If not, let's move into our next video, uh, which is our uh, Langdon Research Extension Center Station Research Agronomist Brian Hansen uh, is going to be talking about a soybean, what is a, a soybean seeding date study. And let's go ahead and play that one. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brian Hansen. I'm the research agronomist here at the Langdon Research Extension Center. And today my topic is seeding date and cultivar influence on soybean performance here in Northeast North Dakota. Now choosing the right combination of seeding date and maturity group is a very important decision to producers and especially here in Northeastern North Dakota. Um, soybean production hasn't really <clears throat> been around our area for very long. In 2000, um, 11, there was about 86,000 acres, and in 2017, there was about 217, or uh, 417,000 acres. So we're along the northern border, so as the growing season has been lengthening over the years, and we've had more adapted varieties that uh, we can plant up here, the soybean acres has increased. Now, soybean maturity is really caused, <clears throat> there's day length affects it, and also growing degree days. And up here along the northern border, growing degree days, we're about five to 700 fewer growing corn growing degree days, which soybeans are based on, compared to the southeast part of the state. So choosing the right variety, the right maturity is very important to producers up in this area. So the study that we conducted, and it was sponsored by the Soybean Council of North Dakota, is, uh, was really initiated back in June of, of 2017, and the idea came to us. We had a hailstorm just east of Langdon here. It took out, um, very large swath of, of soybeans that got hailed out totally on June 9th. June 10th is the final planting date. And so at that time, the RMA was saying, hey, you have to replant these soybean days up to 25 days after the D June 10th date. So that's July 5th, which is very impractical for this part of the state. 
So I was getting a lot of calls from insurance people saying, hey, do you have any hard data on soybean planting date maturities? And we didn't have any for this region. There's a lot of uh, data for central and southeastern North Dakota, but that is not adapted to our region. And <clears throat> up in this part of the area, we plant soybeans that are earliest maturing to start with. It's 0, 0 0.5 to 0, 0, um, 0.1 generally. But if you go down to the south, down to the south of Fargo, they plant 0 0.4, 0 0.5. So if they had a hail event on June 9th, they could pick some of these early varieties where up here in the north we're already growing early varieties. So the methods we used, um, we picked uh, five seeding dates, uh, starting about um, May 15th all the way up to towards the end of June, seven to 10 days, uh, whenever we could get in the field. And for soybeans, we maturity groups, we picked the 0, 0 0.5 is one of the earliest, 0, 0 0.9 and 0 0.1. So if we look at the graph to some of the data we had from 2018, on May 15th, our first date, the 0, 0 0.9 and 0 0.1 had the highest yields, about six bushel better than the 0, 0 0.5. While we went to the May 24th date, we saw similar uh, results, only not quite as much yield difference. They yielded about four bushel better, the later maturing varieties. However, as we got into June, we saw <clears throat> that the variety 0, 0 0.9 had the highest yields, and actually the earliest variety and the latest variety had uh, yields that were not significant from one another. And at the June 14th date, the <clears throat> earliest variety had the highest yield. So if we look at the varieties um, from the May 15th to June 14th, the 0, 0 0.5 only dropped about 25%, where the 0, 0 0.9 maturity group and 0, 0. Or 0 0.1 dropped 39%. Um, so you see the later maturing varieties have the highest yields early on, but as we get into June and the shorter time frame, um, the yields drop off quite significantly. And on the June 24th date that year, we planted none of the varieties matured. We had our first freeze on September 29th. Uh, this past year in 2019, well, it was quite a year in North Dakota, and uh, we had again planted this trial and uh, we harvested the first and second date. And again, the, with similar results, the later maturing varieties did better compared to the early ones in the first and second date. But the last three dates, uh, we got a snowstorm up here. We had about 20 inches of snow. Uh, the snow was above the soybeans. And uh, when it melted, it dragged all the soybeans to the ground and it basically made harvestable unattainable. So we didn't get any results last year, but we did plant the trial again this year. And uh, we should have, hopefully, results if the weather treats its right. So that's the information I had on soybean seeding date and uh, what maturity group to plant on which date. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, good information. Uh, farmers will appreciate uh, the end of this project, and hopefully, it'll help them out in their operations. Um, any questions for Brian? Yeah, we got the trials looking good this year. Um, well, it was looking good last year too. But hopefully, uh, we'll get some better results at the end and. Obviously, from the late spring we had, there was a lot of fields that were planted late. And you drive around the countryside, there's a lot of soybeans that are <clears throat> um, not very far along yet. So we'll see how it goes this year. So, is there any questions on on the trial? Uh, hello, Brian. This is uh, Igor Dinadan Karnayan. Uh, I have a question. Uh, do you face this uh, IDC problem, iron deficiency chlorosis problem? Um, yeah, in certain areas uh, in our region, we have it, um, it's, uh, more so in the valley, and it's not as um, prevalent where okay. we have, have a flat land in the valley, and our pHs are a little, a little bit uh, lower up here than we have in the valley, but uh, there are certain areas um, that we do see that here in the northeast part of the state. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, thank you, Brian. Uh, let's move along then. Um, our next speaker uh, is the Langdon Research Extension Center Soil Health Specialist, Naeem Kalwar, and uh, he is going to talk about some salt tolerant crops in North Dakota. <laughs> Barley and oats are the two most salt-tolerant annual crops producers can successfully plant 
on saline sodic areas in North Dakota. They will establish their other annual crops like canola or soybeans will not do well. Also, one of the worst things we could do to these saline sodic areas is to plant a crop that will not do well there. Planting crops on saline sodic areas that are not salt tolerant will not only result in loss of revenue, but it will also make the salinity and sodicity issues worse. In some cases, that may also lead to heavy wheat pressure. Excess water soluble salts compete with plant roots for water, whereas sodicity results in poor soil structure. Here at the Langdon REC, we have a saline sodic gradient that runs from east, their salt and sodicity levels are low compared to west, there, there are very high levels of salinity and sodicity. In order to check at what salt and sodicity levels we could successfully plant barley and oat crops, we have planted four barley and four oat varieties and three replications. Barley varieties are Pinnacle, ACC Synergy, ND Genesis, and Tradition. Oat varieties include Rockford, CS Kempton, ND Hart, and SARS. First replication represent low salt and sodicity levels. The soil saturated paste electrical conductivity here is 3.99 and 7.32 millimoles per centimeter for the 0 to 6 and 6 to 24 inch soil depths. Sodium absorption ratio is 7.12 and 15.05 for the same soil depths. We could see that all barley and oat varieties have germinated well here. Also, when we were getting the seed bed ready, this area was very mellow compared to the other two replications. The barley and oat varieties are quite salt tolerant compared to other annual crops. However, generally, once the soil EC levels in the top soil get to 8 or more millimoles per centimeter, even these crops will not do well. That is what we can see in the second replication. The EC levels here are 7.8 and 10.39, whereas SAR levels are 18.13 and 20.92 for the 0 to 6 and 6 to 24 inch soil depths. So you can see the impact of higher surface salt and sodicity levels on barley and oat germination, which is quite poor compared to the first replication. Also, here when we were trying to get the seed bed ready, this area was difficult to till and there were big clumps. That is exactly what sodicity does to the soils, resulting in poor soil structure. Now, if we move on to the very high salt and sodicity replication or area, there's no germination at all, whether it's barley or oats. EC levels here are 10.5 and 9.86, with SAR levels of 27.3 and 32.87 for the 0 to 6 and 6 to 24 inch depths. This research trial shows us few things so far. Number one, it is very helpful to analyze the soil salinity and sodicity levels before planting on these kind of uh, unproductive areas. Number second, we could profitably plant and grow barley and oats on areas with low to maybe moderate levels of salinity and sodicity. However, if the salt and sodicity levels become too high, for even crops like barley and oats, then the best option will be to plant a mix of perennial salt tolerant grasses. Thank you, Naeem. Very good presentation. Uh, anything to add, Naeem? Yeah, I would like to emphasize uh, the soil sampling part and I want to differentiate. Uh, most often our producers uh, get their soils sampled and get them checked for fertility. And those results most often will not tell you about the soil salt levels or the sodicity levels. Um, you do see salt levels which are mentioned as millimoles per centimeter mostly. Sometimes the units are decisimens per meter. Those are the EC levels. 
Uh, but those tests are done through one-to-one -one soil to water ratio method, which again gives us a lower um, soil EC levels compared to what the actual levels are. There's nothing wrong with the method, it's just it gives you a diluted salt level. So it's not really accurate compared to what plants actually face in the soil. The saturated paste is the most accurate method. But it, it unless you ask the labs, they will not check uh, you know, those samples for sodicity, which is the SAR or sodium adsorption ratio. So if you don't know about these issues, you'll just keep planting regular crops. On an average, um, producers spend from 85 bucks to 170, 80 dollars just at the time of planting. And I showed a few pictures in these videos. You saw what happened on those areas. So when we talk about profit, Saving the money where you have no germination or very poor stand is also a profit. Whether you're renting the land, whether you own the land, that's one thing. And then remember, when there's no vegetative cover, that would make these issues actually worse. And then there would be weeds growing, then we'll have to go back and till it, and tilling these areas is even worse. And if you were sprayed, you would be spending money on herbicides where you're not going to harvest a crop. So the bottom line is um, take samples, please. And remember two major tests, soil EC or electrical conductivity and SAR through saturated paste method. And once you have those numbers, show them to uh, your crop consultant, county extension agents, people like me, and then we could guide you what what crop you could plant. Can you plant annual crop? There are some fields where you probably may not be able to plant soybeans, but you may be able to get a decent wheat or canola crop, or maybe, I know there are not good contracts available for barley. It's an excellent crop when it comes to salt tolerance. Oats are also good, but there are spots which won't even support these. You saw one example where the salt and the sodicity levels are high. So. Um, I will end my message with this. Please get these, uh, treat these unproductive areas separately than your good areas. You could do whatever you want on the good areas. Whatever seeds you plant, it will germinate, but these unproductive areas are challenging and the issues will keep getting worse. I also want to remind you guys that um, if you could unmute yourself to ask us any questions. If not, you could also type in the chat box. Even after, you know, for example, Venkat's video was played a couple videos back, but you could always uh, type these questions in the chat box and we'll, we'll answer, try to answer those questions. All right, thank you, Naeem. And uh, uh, also I'll just uh, add to your presentation that for any of those landowners out there that need help soil sampling, uh, Naeem is well equipped to be able to help with uh, sampling those uh, those uh, areas that aren't very productive. And uh, I think that's probably the first step of, of finding out what to do with those unproductive areas. But uh, if you need help, Naeem has the tools to help you out. Okay, so if there's no other questions, we'll go on to the next video. And uh, this video is uh, by myself, uh, Randy Malf, the director here at the LREC. Uh, one of the main missions that we have with the Egg Experiment Station is our Foundation Seed Stocks Program. And we have a short video that uh, details the Foundation Seed Stocks Program. This is Randy Melhoff, Langdon Research Extension Center Director, talking about an important program at the Langdon REC designed to keep the newest and most superior NDSU crop varieties available to North Dakota producers. This program is called the NDSU Foundation Seed Stocks Program. The program itself is administered in the Plant Sciences Department at NDSU, and there are five locations throughout North Dakota that are responsible for foundation seed production. Those locations are the Agronomy Seed Farm located at Castleton and at four RECs located throughout North Dakota, Williston, Minot, Carrington, and of course Langdon. When a new NDSU crop variety is released to the public, it is essential to rapidly increase seed of the new variety so it is available to the seed industry and farmers in the area. 
extreme care and production efficiency all the way from field selection to seed conditioning of the newly harvested seed is required to maintain the highest levels of varietal purity. This is accomplished under a stringent quality control program in cooperation with the North Dakota State Seed Department. The NDSU Langdon Research Extension Center serves Northeast North Dakota, a region that leads North Dakota in hard red spring wheat and canola production. The Foundation Seed Stocks Program at Langdon includes 550 acres and produces flax, hard red spring wheat, barley, and recently soybeans and other pulse crops. Or in Northeast North Dakota, over 50% of the hard red spring wheat grown comes from NDSU varieties, which makes this program even more important to our producers. Foundation seed produced at the Langdon Research Extension Center is then distributed to area seedsmen and county crop improvement associations to be sold in the future as registered or certified seed. The overall Foundation Seed Stocks effort is designed to get the newest and most superior NDSU varieties of seed in the hands of all farmers quickly and efficiently. Okay, great video. What a great video that was. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. Um, I would just add that uh, the Foundation Seed Stocks program at Langdon has been uh, ongoing since about 1960. And we did uh, uh, point it out in the video, uh, just in the last three, four years, we've moved into uh, soybeans and other pulse crops, uh, which uh, poses new challenges uh, for the Seed Stocks program. But it's worked out very well so far, and whatever uh, varieties of whatever crops uh, the producer demands, we'll do our best to uh, uh, get the very best variety available and out to them so they can grow that variety. So anyway, uh, let's move on to the next topic. Uh, the next topic uh, kind of involves the weather we've had the last few years uh, with the late fall that we've had and uh, or with the, the wet fall and the late uh, planting season, uh, we seem to have some prevent plant issues that we're dealing with here in North Dakota. So the next video uh, deals with options you might be able to uh, uh, consider uh, if you are putting some of your land in prevent plant. <laughs> Good morning. This is Randy Melhoff, director of the Langdon Research Extension Center. In 2019, every grower in Northeast North Dakota suffered most likely the worst harvest conditions ever. No matter what the crop, many fields were unharvested and fall tillage was rare. At the Langdon REC, we recorded 20 days of rain between the period of August 25th to August 6th. This was typical in Northeast North Dakota and would not allow the crop to dry down to safe storage levels. Then, on October 7th, Northeast North Dakota experienced a 20 to 27 inch snow event effectively shutting down harvest for good. The 2020 growing season in Northeast North Dakota began much cooler than average and coupled with additional challenges from 2019, numerous fields could not be planted within the planting date window. Therefore, many growers throughout North Dakota are forced to deal with prevent plant options in 2020 for fields that could not be planted in a timely fashion. It is projected there will be 1 million acres of prevent plant acreage throughout all of North Dakota in 2020. For my brief, brief presentation today, I would like to roll out the four options available to growers in 2020 for preventive planting. It is highly recommended that prior to making any late season prevent plant decisions, to review these options for your individual farm with your county FSA office and your trusted insurance agent. So let's get to the options. Option one, continue planting insured crops after the final planting date for those crops. In option one, growers will experience a 1% loss per day in coverage up to the last day of the insured crops late planting period. Generally, the late planting date is usually 15 to 25 days after final planting date for the insured crop. This of course depends on the insured crop as each insured crop has its own final planting date. Option two, leave the prevent plant acres idle or fallowed. If the grower decides on leaving the prevent plant acres idle or fallowed throughout the growing season, he or she will receive full prevent plant payments. Full prevent plant payments are usually 50 to 60% of the yield or revenue protection guarantee. 
The grower also has the option of receiving an extra 5% of yield or revenue guarantee if he or she agrees on a premium increase. The grower should also know there is a requirement to follow USDA guidelines for locally approved covers or practices for farmland prior to winter under this option. Option three, plant a cover crop after the late planting period and receive full or reduced prevent plant payment. A grower can generate extra income with no penalty if cover crop mix is hayed, baled, cut for silage or baleage on or after November 1st. Having crops mature and dry down in this scenario could be a challenge for Northeast North Dakota growers. A possible example would be replanting leftover peas or barley after the late planting period. If the cover crop is harvested for grain at any time, the prevent plant payment would be reduced to 35%. And option four, plant cover crop after the late planting period to hay, graze, cut for silage or baleage. This could be a good option for livestock producers concerning late season prevent planting. Planting hay and harvesting or grazing prior to November 1 will afford the grower 35% of the guaranteed prevent plant payment. Haying or grazing on or after November 1 will afford the grower 100% of the guaranteed prevent plant payment. Thank you ladies and gentlemen for your interest in prevent plant options. Undeniably, the very best advice I can give you is to remind you to find time to contact your county FSA office and trusted insurance agent to determine which option is best for your farm for late season prevent plant options. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, any uh, questions, any comments regarding prevent plant? Uh, for those in that, uh, for those that are faced with that scenario, we wish you uh, all the luck and hopefully next year we'll get everything put in. So with that, let's move on to our next video. Uh, Dr. Larry Chahachek, NDSU Professor of Soil Science, will be talking about evaluating suitability of soils for tiling. My name is Larry Chahachik. I'm a uh, professor of soil science at NDSU, uh, working in uh, soil management, soil fertility, soil chemistry. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is something that is of interest to a lot of growers, particularly in the eastern part of the state, and that is evaluating our soils for the suitability for drainage. Tile drainage is a, it has been uh, increasing throughout a lot of parts of North Dakota because we've got issues uh, where uh, we've had too much water, we've got water standing on the soil, uh, it doesn't run off, our landscapes are pretty flat, so we end up with uh, at times problems with uh, areas of field flooding out or standing water and then we also get stuck with our equipment and that becomes a problem. Now, the, the reason we drain soils is to reduce the amount of excess water in the soil profile. And, and part of the problem is that we have a fairly flat landscape. Uh, we, I think we all know what a landscape is. That's the curvature of the earth, you know, with the hills and valleys and this sort of thing. But the one thing we don't always see is there's another landscape, and that's what we would call the hydrological landscape, or the subsurface water table landscape. And water does move from higher areas to lower areas, but a lot of times when we see a wet area in the field that's not drying out, it may not be drainage. It may be that that water is actually the top of the water table. Now, an, a an area where tile drainage uh, is very useful, and that is to remove excess water. We've got some problem soils. We've got three different types of soils that we find. We've got saline soils. These are soils that are affected with salts. Uh, and this is usually shown by a white crust on the surface when they're dry. We've got other soils that are sodic soils. These are affected with sodium and this, the, the high amount of sodium causes the soils to disperse. So either they're very greasy and slick when wet, or they're hard like concrete when they're dry. They do not allow water to move through there. Saline soils will because the salinity keeps the soil structure intact. It keeps it flocculated, we call it flocculation. And so water can move through the salt affected with salt, with sodium we can't. We've got another type of salts, and these are affected with both sodium and salts. Many times we can drain the, sodic, uh, the sodium 
the sealing sodic soils fairly readily, but once you drain it and remove the salts, then they harden up again, and, and it affects our, our uh, uh, drainage. Uh, one of the things that we would like to do before we put in a tile drain, there are some other issues out here in the soils, but before we put in tile drains, it would be nice to know what these soils are like. And if there are some things in the soil profile between where the tile drain is and the soil surface. And many times we don't see these from the soil surface. Um, oftentimes we have these areas and fields that are wet and they stay wet all year long. Again, like I mentioned, it's probably the water table. Sometimes it could be a sodium layer underneath the surface. We do get plants growing on these soils sometimes, but the water just won't drain through them. And, and we have worked with some examples like that at the uh, Langdon Research Extension Center, where water will pond on the surface, but it will not go through even with tile drainage in there. Another problem that we have uh, in some of the areas, particularly, particularly along the edges of the, uh, the Red River Valley, and that is we've got soils that are layered. Uh, we've got, and, and, and these layers are caused by the level of the water in the lake either rising or dropping over many, many years. When the lakes were high, uh, we would have deposits of clay because clay particles are very small and water flows in, drainage water from the melting glaciers would flow in. The, the uh, sands would drop out, therefore we've got the sand hills in southeastern North Dakota and the Cheyenne Delta. But then we would also have these clays that would get suspended and go out into the lake, and over time they would settle out. So you've got zones that are real sandy. Again, if the lake dropped and a lot of water came in fast, then it would bring in sand. So we've got layers of sand and clay. And, and sometimes if we put a tile line underneath those uh, layers of clay, we are not able to move water through those clay layers, especially if they're sodic. And there are some sodic soils in the valley here. There's some series like X-Line. It's one of the series uh, that a lot of times has these zones in there. And they're very sodic. So when they wet up, the, 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 the sodium causes the salts to swell, and it just seals them off. I've seen uh, a tiled field with soils like this after a four inch rain with the, the discharge pumps pumping madly, but a week later there's still water standing on the soil surface because the water could not move through that, uh, those, those clay layers to form uh, or, or to, to, to get to the tile line and get drained and the water was pumped was coming out from somewhere else underneath those clay layers. We do have a tool uh, that's really kind of nice. It's called Web Soil Survey. It's uh, a website that's uh, uh, located with the uh, uh, USDA NRCS uh, website, where you can go in there and find, uh, on, the, on the main page, find uh, a tab or a, a menu that says Soils. Click on the Soils, you'll come up with the Soils page, you'll get some other information there, and there's a green button there that says Web Soil Survey. You click on that thing, and you log into the web soil survey. Uh, the nice thing about this is there's a tremendous amount of all kinds of information in the web soil survey. Next thing you do, you find your area, your field that you're interested in, and there's a number of different menu items there. I like to use uh, where the, 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 the item where you can uh, uh, enter in your section, uh, township and range for the field. Uh, in North Dakota and when you do that it will bring up that section and then you can move to another part of the menu where you can click on uh, a tab that that allows you to draw a box around that field or we call it the area of interest that area of interest will will delineate the the area that you're interested in and it will bring up a soils map of that area now embedded in the soils map is all kinds of information about those soils. And there are some other tabs uh, at the top. One of them is, well there's there several, uh, one of them is called the Soil Data Explorer, where you can get into and look at a lot of different properties of these soils. And under there, there's another set of tabs. 
And what you might want to look at is salt properties and qualities. You get another menu and there's a whole bunch of different chemical and physical properties that you can log into. The one that you're most uh, likely or the most useful is something called the sodium adsorption value. Sodium adsorption value gives you a, a, an indication of, of uh, the sodicity of these soils. And the nice thing about this is you can look at different layers in the soil. And I like to go foot by foot by foot, or you can take a whole profile, four foot profile, and uh, look at what the SAR is. And what it does, it brings up a map of that field uh, showing us SAR. You can also go into the interpretive data that comes with it. There are tables, several tables, and, and there are tables in there that will show you the suitability for drainage, which are, are uh, ranked on a scale of zero to one. If, if your soils are closer to zero, they're very suitable for drainage. If they're closer to one, then they might have some serious limitations. Uh, and, and, and so these will give you an idea of whether you're, you're going to have a problem with these fields. Uh, one nice thing is, is that you can sort of get an idea of the suitability of these soils. Um, and we're in the process of revising a publication, SF 1617, uh, uh, called Evaluating Soils for Suitability for Tile Drainage. Um, there are some tables in there listing the soil type, soil series that we know are sodic and those that may be sodic. Uh, and this also gives you an indication of potential problems. Most of the time, tile installers will look at the texture and they may look at the depth, but they don't look at some of these chemical properties. And so they may, it, it may seem that these soils are suitable for drainage, but these properties you can't see in there, the chemical properties, are going to influence how well or how uh, useful the drainage will be. So uh, from, from, from this data, then you've got some reason to, or some basis to make a decision whether it's worth spending money to, to reduce or to, to, to drain your soils. The other thing is, I want to leave you that draining saline soils is not a problem. Uh, and and we, can, we can look at those things too, but it's really the sodium that causes the problem. Sodium and unseen layers of uh, different textures within that soil profile. If you have a soil that looks like a problem, get a soil scientist out there, pull a few cores and take a look at the profile. Um, you can even run some soil tests, run some salinity and sodium tests on them. It, will give you an idea to confirm whether you've got it or not. The one thing you've got to remember is that soil surveys are generalized and there may be areas as large as five acres within that area with any soil type that may be a different soil type. And, and some of these inclusions, that, as we call them, could have sodium in them uh, or they may not. And so if you are able to sort of identify uh, you know, the soil is what is out there or there's a lot of variability out there, then you can do, look at some other things and find some other uh, considerations on how to manage these soils. Uh, I've given you some ideas on, on some tools to use that are available. Uh, the, the web soil survey is a very powerful tool because there's all sorts of things that you can use it for. Uh, suitability for tree plantings, building sites, there's a lot of data in there, and, and uh, all of this is based on soils that have been collected around the state over time and analyzed in detail to look at what their actual physical and chemical characteristics are. And then they're linked to the various soil, uh, uh, soil series within the surveys, and, and, and you can get a generalization of, of how uh, soils will be productive or how useful they will be, or if you're going to have some limitations on your use. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Uh, we have next uh, Dr. Andrew Green is the NDSU hard red spring wheat breeder. And uh, we asked him to give us an update on his uh, program for Northeast North Dakota. Well, good morning and Thank you for the invitation to speak today at the 
virtual field day for the Langdon Research Extension Center. My name is Andrew Green. I'm the Spring Wheat Breeder at NDSU. And I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about a variety review from data that's unique to the Langdon area uh, over the past few years. And, you know, I'd rather be standing in a field and discussing these things with you and um, be able to walk through and look at lines and see how they're doing this year. But in some ways, even though this virtual format um, is different, you know, we're able to do some things that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. And one of the things I thought might be interesting is to share some of this data with you that I would have used to compile my presentation were I there at the field day. Um, but to be able to really get a closer look at what um, is going on and be able to see some things that we wouldn't be able to see from the tour wagons. So what we're looking at here is a figure that's showing a comparison of yield by protein. Protein on the y-axis here would be higher as you go up. And the same with yield, the further to the right, we would have higher yields. So in the top left corner would be things with a high protein and a low yield. And in the bottom right would be things with a high yield and a low protein. So what do we see from this kind of a figure? Well, the first thing we notice, as you would probably expect, is that the negative relationship between yield and protein is pretty evident. We know this because we know that typically high yielding lines have tend to have lower protein and vice versa. But what I'd like to show you is that there are plenty of lines that uh, don't follow this trend exactly. And the way that I've chosen to share this with you is with a set of numbers that are called best linear unbiased predictions. Now, this is a very similar mathematical approach to what's used to calculated um, estimated breeding values or estimated progeny differences in cattle. These approaches we got from the animal science folks. And so um, a high blup value for a trait like grain yield um, might be analogous to, you know, a high um, estimated breeding value for, you know, milk yield or other things like this. So that's why these numbers yield in particular is on a scale from minus 15 to 15. The average yield of all the lines in this comparison is at zero. So if you look at the average for yield and protein, the average falls somewhere around that X that I just drew where there's a cluster of lines right in the middle of the figure. So if you go higher than this line for protein and higher to the right of this line for yield, you have things that are higher than average yield, higher than average protein. So these things are reversing the trend from what we would normally see, which is a strong negative relationship. So Dynagro Ambush, AC Goodwin, MN Torgi, ND Froberg, um, Mott, which is not a very traditional Northeastern North Dakota line, but has performed well in the Langdon area. These are things that have had good yields with good proteins. So what do we have down here in this corner? We have high yield, low protein. Does that necessarily mean that the quality is bad? Not necessarily, but there's a pretty strong chance that the end use milling and baking quality won't be as good on these lines. We can find ways to look that up using our variety trial results and extension guide that's released every fall that has all of this annual data in it. So the quadrant of the graph that we would really ideally like to be in is up here, top right, high yield, high protein. A lot of your racehorse varieties are, and a lot of these are very familiar to many of you, are down in this category. Again, doesn't guarantee the quality is bad, but it means that the protein might get low in a year where the yields are high. Where do we want to stay away from? We want to stay out of this quadrant. This corner down here in the bottom left would be low yield and low protein, not a good situation. This quadrant up here in the top left 
is strongly lower than average yield and strongly higher than average protein. So if you're looking for really high protein and you don't mind uh, low yields relative to the rest of the trial, you might be looking in this area right up here. And technically that would apply to all of the things that are all the way in this square. But as you get closer to the middle of this cluster here, this, these lines here are what you would consider to be sort of average in many ways in the trial. The things in the bottom right hand corner as you get further and further away, those are exceptionally different. Okay, so what do we have in the quadrant of lines that where we would like to be? Dine and Grow Ambush. This is a line that um, has had pretty strong yield performance in this area. It has mediocre BLS bacteria leaf streak and fusarium head blight uh, resistance. And the end use quality is not too bad. So um, one, you're probably gonna have to monitor for diseases, but overall um, it's tested pretty well. Um, AC Goodwin, this is a Canadian line that is not quite available to farmers in North Dakota yet. I think there's a possibility that it could be in future years. Um, and then Torgi, that's a line from the Minnesota program that was just released. Um, pretty strong quality on this line. The stability and the absorption, not too bad. Uh, low volume wasn't as good as it could be, but um, certainly uh, average to above average um, with pretty good disease resistance overall on that line as well. ND Froberg is a new release from our program that has uh, very good quality. And um, as far as diseases go, it's moderately resistant to bacterial leaf streak, to scab, to the rusts. Um, again, something that when it's outside of that normal trend line, above average for both yield and protein might be worth taking a look at. So the corner that I would really encourage you to think twice about, again, is down here in the bottom right. Um, we're not guaranteed to have poor quality here, but you really need to look at your variety trial results and extension guide to see. And if you're gonna only look at three categories, the three that you've heard me mention so far, that I would really say you could seek out and try to stay as high as you can. Farinograph absorption, which is basically water absorption of the flower the stability, which is a measure of the strength of the dough, and then loaf volume, which is just literally measuring that uh, physical volume of the miniature loaves of bread that are baked during testing. If it's got high marks for those and the grain protein stays good, um, it's probably a pretty decent quality line. So low protein doesn't guarantee low quality, um, but in the cases of a few of these lines like LCS Trigger, LCS Nitro, uh, the quality is, has not been good. Um, things that you really would want to think twice about despite the fact that they've got this extremely high uh, yield potential. I would work your way back toward the pack here on some of the lines that are in this area if you're looking for really high yield potential and sort out those that have the disease resistance that's important to you and also possessing good end use quality. So there's way too many lines to go through and talk about them all individually, but this is how I would encourage you to break down and think about um, wh what's important to you and why. Uh, that results guide again is gonna have the most up-to-date information on diseases. For bacteria leaf streak, what we're finding is that Anything greater than a seven, a seven or higher, um, you're looking at a pretty strong chance of decreased yield potential in an, in an environment where that disease is present. For fusarium head blight, uh, you're gonna probably ideally like to be in the four or less rating. The fives and sixes are lines that get, you're gonna have to monitor your risk um, and look at the scab forecasting models to make fungicide decisions. Anything a seven or greater, you're looking at a pretty risky scenario for development of the disease. Um, and so I would really encourage you to, to think carefully about 
uh, things that are a seven or higher on that scale that we that we release. Um, those are the things that I think are important for making variety decisions. Again, um, I'm not necessarily trying to highlight or pick on anything in particular with this figure, um, but again, just showing you that there are things out there that have um, higher than average yield with, with good, strong quality profile um, and decent straw. This is, uh, this scale here, grays and blues are good for straw strength. Uh, the red dots are, are problems, things that might be, uh, have poorer straw. And so we've got different ways of manipulating this data. I'll show some of these types of things at winter meetings, but if you have questions about varieties or you're curious about interpreting the quality data or you're interested in learning more about this breakdown I've got here of, of yield versus protein and things like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, my number, my information is on the NDSU website. You can call me, you can email me. Um, if you want to just visit about the things you think we should be doing in the breeding program, that's fine too. Uh, but give me a call and I'd love to talk to you about it and hopefully uh, things will be a little bit more back to normal by this time next year and we can get together and talk about something similar um, in a wheat field. So thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of your tour. Okay, that was Dr. Andrew Green, NDSU Hard Red Spring Wheat uh, Breeder. Uh, seems to be making some pretty good progress. Uh, if there isn't any questions. Oh, Randy. Yeah. I'd just like to say that we still have our uh, hard red spring wheat drill strips and durum strips, and we're putting the signs out in a day or two. So sometimes a lot of people like to come out in the evenings and look at the different wheat varieties. So that'll be available. That's directly uh, west of the research center, or you could call ahead of time and find out where they're at. All right. Thank you, Brian. Good point. Uh, we like to have our producers come out here and look at our work. So uh, that consider that an invitation. Okay, well, let's see. Well, let's move on. Uh, our next video is from Dr. Dave Franzen, uh, Extension Soil Specialist, and he's going to be talking about the unique fertility requirements for the Langdon area. My name is Dave Franz and I'm one of the soil specialists here at NDSU, uh, specializing more in soil fertility than Dr. Wick is, who's soil health. So I visited with uh, Naeem uh, the other day and, and I think what I'd like to reinforce is, is why we separated out that Langdon area as a special, special consideration when we do our nitrogen recommendations for wheat, sunflowers, corn, anything really. So my first summer here, which has been 26 years now this year, uh, I was riding around with a soil survey person, uh, Mike Sweeney, who's passed away now for a number of years. But I was noticing once I got into Langdon that, that you go past the field and a large part of the flax was laying flat, the barley was laying flat, the wheat was laying flat, uh, any small grain you saw. It wasn't a whole field, of course, but there were a large part of all the fields. And I hadn't seen that in my tour up to that point. So it uh, stuck with me. In 2010, we gathered uh, data, and I gathered data from all over the state uh, for the past decade or two, uh, and some recent data from up in that area. The numbers told me that the nitrogen rate we needed in order to grow, to grow a wheat crop up there was substantially different than it was in the rest of eastern North Dakota. So I, I carved it out. I, I carved out an area that's kind of E-shaped from Devil's Lake uh, northwest and then northeast. It uh, includes the Langdon area, so I, so I just call it the Langdon area. And without really knowing anything else but the numbers, I just assumed that the reason that was is that the organic matter tends to be a little bit more up there because it's just a cooler climate, shorter season, and, and it's a cooler climate too, so it doesn't, it's not like Texas where the, where the organic matter just burns up, literally. So I just thought it was like that. And so when we came out with the recommendations, I was out in Bismarck and I was given a talk on the new recommendations. And I was talking about the Langdon area as part of it. And, and afterwards, a, a friend of mine, a colleague, Mike Ulmer, 
who's retired now from NRCS, but just a really stellar soil survey person in the state of North Dakota. He came up to me and he was just, he was just giddy. He said that that area that you described, we always knew that there was something different about that, but we really didn't have any data to substantiate it. So he, so he, he gave me the links to a couple of of peer-reviewed papers, and one was from a North Dakota scientist, a soil survey person, that described almost like I drew it, a V-shaped area up in north, northeast North Dakota that he called the Shaley area. And uh, it is true, when we were up there poking holes with Mike years and years ago, uh, every, every probe that we put into the ground, there's these little pieces of of flat rock, flat gray rock, and and far you know you, you farmers that farm that area, you know what I'm talking about because you've seen it too during your tillage, and if you're taking soil samples, you know it's there. So that was part of it is that that's the shaley area. There's shale close to the surface, and it's mixed in with the soil. But then the kicker was that a USDA scientist from Mandan uh, got an idea about. 30, 40 years ago, and took that shale out of that soil, them soil samples, and did a nitrogen mineralization study on them. And it turns out there's a high amount of mineralizable ammonium in that shale, which means that that shale releases nitrogen slowly over time. So it's really not the climate that's different, why we have that that credit up there, that different recommendation scheme, it's because the soil itself is a slow release fertilizer. And so the nitrogen recommendations, uh, we, I have them nailed down for the, for the wheat, certainly, because that's where we had the most data from that area, is that it used to be a real big wheat country before scab. And, um, and so we had uh, quite a bit of data, and the data told me that I had to do that. But that's, that's the reason, is that it has high amounts of mineralizable ammonia in it. So I would think if I was growing any crop up there that needed nitrogen, I'd back the rate off by 30 pounds at least. Uh, if it's not in the recommendations for sure, I mean, if it's not written down that you should do this, I'd, I'd still just lop 30 pounds off the top. Um, just to make sure you weren't putting too much. If nothing else, it's a cost. And uh, we also know that too much, too much nitrogen for sunflowers, for example, increases the amount of disease you might have. And it certainly would increase the lodging and lower the oil content of canola. Uh, too much nitrogen is not, just not good. So if you're in the Langdon area, back it off. Okay, thank you, Dr. Franzen. A very interesting video there. Um, we always knew Langdon was a little unique, and there's another reason why. So, uh, anyway, any questions? If not, uh, we'll move into our next video. Um, our next video is uh, from Dr. Andrew Friskop, who is our NDSU Extension Plant Pathologist, and uh, he is going to be giving us a 2020 small grain disease update for our region. Uh, good morning everyone, um, I'm Andrew Friskup, I'm the Cereal Extension Plant Pathologist at NDSU and today I'm going to give you kind of a small grain disease update and what we're expecting for the rest of the year in the Langdon Northeast uh, North Dakota. To best summarize what we saw early on is we did not see a lot of fungal leaf spots. You know, we're used to scouting for them, seeing them arrive early, but this year is a little bit different. We didn't, we didn't have those long due periods that really promote the infection of those pathogens, so we had more of a later disease onset. Also, with the common practice of putting a fungicide down with that herbicide, most of our early disease type of issues were, were less common as, as far as what we've seen in previous years. Um, with the Northeast, there's one big exception as a 
as opposed to the rest of the state was the appearance of rain and frequent rain. So the one thing that we have to start thinking about is what is the Fresarium head blight risk this year? If you want to look at a state, uh, a more of a state impact of Fresarium head blight risk, the greatest risk uh, beginning in the middle of June, starting in the middle of June, has been in Northeast North Dakota. And that risk has only gotten higher as we start moving to the 4th of July weekend. And I know there's a lot of heading out wheat and I know there's headed out barley. And we have to start thinking about when are we going to put down that fungicide. So the two things that I always want to mention about a fungicide, one is know what you're using and when to apply it. The best products to use out there that provide the most amount of suppression of the disease are Prosaro, Corumba, Miravis Ace. Uh, those have routinely always provided about 50, sometimes 60 percent suppression depending on the year. The next thing that we should focus on is when should we be making those applications. So if you think about starting with wheat, the best time to make that application is when we start seeing the onset of flowering, or when we start seeing those yellow anthers start ext extruding from the center of the head. Now the common question always is, should we be too early or too late? Uh, granted, sometimes you're just forced to one decision, but our research over the last five to eight years have suggested that being a little bit too late is better than too early. Now you're still getting suppression regardless if you apply too early or too late, but we're seeing a little bit more on the back end of flowering. And the best way to describe that is if your wheat flower, if your wheat field is flowering today, you have about seven days to make that application to get good disease suppression, but also protect that yield. Now when we look at barley, we have a little bit of a different timing change, and that more has to do with is that barley does not uh, flower outside of the boot. The best time to make that application is barley was when you have complete full head emergence. And that application uh, window, again, if you want to talk about it, lasts for about seven days. And in some ways you could think about as what stage is barley, is how long the stem is below the head. Um, in this case, my estimation is this is about three or four days after the beginning of full head. And I just want to stress that this is still a good time to make an application if you weren't, out, if you weren't able to get out there already. So the two big things is what you're using and when to apply it. The other thing that I want to focus on is one disease I think that we're going to start seeing here develop um, in, during the first week of July, and this is bacterial leaf streak. Now when we think about bacterial leaf streak, there's, there's a couple things that I want to point out. One is we're starting to see this disease occur more frequently in the state. And the other thing is it's highly associated when we start seeing strong thunderstorms. So this past couple days we have seen uh, thunderstorms rip across the state and that is more or less a prime time when we're going to start picking up bacterial diseases. Um, Bacterial disease, as the name suggests, do not respond to fungicides, so there's nothing we can spray on them that works effectively, and we are confined to using less susceptible varieties. Now, if you use the variety guide, you're going to see a one to nine scale. Certainly, anything that five or below is kind of what you want to market as far as if you're running into bacterial leaf streak problems. The biggest thing is, is this can be a severe yield limiting disease. As you can see on this sample, you see the streaking, you see the necrotic, and sometimes yellowing streaks running up and down the leaf. When you start hitting the flag leaves, you can start you can start thinking about losing yield potential. Last year on our most susceptible varieties, we documented 50, 60% yield loss. Uh, on the more resistant varieties, they were kept minimal to one to five percent so resistance definitely does pay as we move forward throughout the season uh, my key messages for northeast north dakota is continue to stay on top of your field for sc uh, scouting not only for disease but also for growth stages to see when when or if you're gonna have to make that fungicide application the other thing i always want to encourage is i hope you guys have a very successful and happy harvest thanks for your time and if you need to reach out to me work locally with your county extension agent or you can reach out to me directly Thank you, Dr. Friskop. And uh, uh, Andrew, do you have any updates you'd like to give? Uh, since I've given that video, <clears throat> I, I can say that sometimes I have a crystal ball approach, but I'm getting more reports of bacterial leaf streak. Uh, don't know how severe it is in the state, but it's certainly something that's starting to pick up. And then as far as fusarium head blight risk, it, we still remain fair, relatively high, uh, especially up in that area. Um, I think that the risk is probably going to maintain uh, throughout the rest of the, I guess, the small grain uh, heading and flowering stages. So that's, that's about the only thing I'd like to update unless there's uh, some additional questions out there. Uh, yeah, good update. Uh, and I will say that uh, here in the Langdon area, the planes are flying nonstop. And I think it's a little bit of scab control and white mold on canola so they're really flying so uh 
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Friskop, and thank you for helping keep our producers up to date on how to control these diseases. No problem. Thanks for the time. You bet. Okay, well, we do have one more video that we'd like to sh uh, share with you. Um, Dr. Jan Knodel, who is the NDSU Extension Entomologist, uh, spearheads a very active integrated pest management program, and we ask her to give an update on her program up here in Northeast North Dakota. Hello, my name is Jan Knodel. I'm the Extension Entomologist for North Dakota State University. It's sorry that we can't be with you today, but I still would like to t talk to you about the Integrated Pest Management IPM Crop Survey. Each year growers have to face damage on their crops from insect pests and diseases. So pertinent information about pest problems on these crops is essential for growers to have a productive year. So the IPM crop survey, we hire scouts to work out of the RECs and NDSU main campus. We have the RECs involved, Langdon, Minot, Williston, Dickinson, and Carrington. We hire the scouts in late May, early June, and we train them on proper scouting protocol and pest identification. We survey four major crops, wheat, barley, soybean, and sunflower. These scouts will go out to the field and check the fields using the proper protocol for different diseases, the main ones that impact the crop economic yield losses and quality of the crop. We also monitor for several pests that are not here in North Dakota and they migrate up into the state, like sunflower moth, cereal aphids, and also like wheat rust that gets blown into the state each year. So the scouts are looking for these important pests and when they find them, they, we can then let the growers know that we're going to have some problems perhaps with this pest and that it's here in the state. The information from the scouts is collected every week and compiled and it's put together into a map that is posted on the Integrated Pest Management website. Just Google NDSU and IPM for the maps. We also put alerts into the NDSU Extension Crop and Pest Report for growers so they know to get out and scout for certain pests that may become an economic problem. So we also use traps to monitor for some of the insect pests. And here we have the wheat midge trap. Wheat midge is an economically important pest of wheat causing severe uh, yield losses and quality losses in both hardwood spring wheat and durum wheat when the populations are high. In addition to doing the crop survey, we also collaborate with the North Dakota Department of Agriculture for surveying for exotic pests of wheat. Uh, this, we use the pheromone traps for serving for two exotic insect pests, the Egyptian cotton worm and the old world bollworm. We check these traps and then they're sent to an identifier for proper identification. We also survey in the field when we're out scouting for several exotic diseases, black stem rust, flag smut, and dwarf bunt. In addition, the scouts collect soil samples in the wheat fields. These samples are compiled and then sent to a nematode lab for identification of exotic nematodes in wheat. We've been doing this survey for 10 years with the North Dakota Department of Ag, so we've established a fairly large database. And this database has helped us reduce 
hindrances of phytosanitary certificates on wheat exports of North Dakota. So in summary, the IPM Crop Survey has helped growers make informed decisions about pest management and using pesticides only when necessary and the pests are economic. In addition to our collaboration with the North Dakota Department of Agriculture, we have enhanced wheat exports of North Dakota into other countries. Thank you, have a good day. All right, thank you, Dr. Knodel, for that IPM update. Uh, I think it's a real good example, uh, Jan's program there of uh, how NDSUA tries to be more proactive than reactive when it comes to production problems, and uh, that's a good example. So uh, anyway, uh, that actually is our last video. Um, I would just like to remind everybody that uh, at the conclusion of this uh, Zoom meeting or Zoom field day, uh, all of these videos will be available on Langdon's website. So you're able to uh, uh, re-review them if you'd like, and uh, they will be on there from now on. And other than that, uh, does anybody have any other comments? Uh, Jan, would you, uh, uh, it's been a couple of weeks since we gave that update. Do you have anything sure. more to add? Uh, well, right now we're seeing a um, army worm outbreak or a lot of people in the northeast and all the way out to the north central region and then south down to Carrington. Uh, it's kind of a triangle there. Uh, we're seeing a lot of army worms and wheat and barley. So um, get out and scout your fields for army worms. There is a article in the crop and pest report on army worms and scouting and thresholds uh, this week that just came out this morning. So the one of the problems and the decision that growers need to make is the worms are very mature now. So we're getting to the point where it will not be economical if you spray that insecticide for treatment. And I also visited with a grower uh, who did try to spray and control the mature worms, which are an inch and a half to two inches long. And he had very poor control with a couple of different insecticides. So he sprayed twice and he still didn't get control. So what is happening is the mature worms are getting ready to pupate and then go down into the soil. Um, so they're not feeding. So they're not ingesting that insecticide. So as a result, you're just getting partial control. So, and that's why it doesn't get economical. Most of the damage is already done. And we usually call this, the pest managers call this revenge spraying. So anyway, um, check your fields for armyworms. They're very unpredictable. They migrate into North Dakota and they're very sporadic. One field can have a heavy infestation. The field across the road will have no armyworms. So it's just field to field scouting. So Jan, this is kind of a new problem, isn't it? Or... Uh, no, we can get, we get, get usually armyworms at least in the Southeast here every, just about every year. But it's not usual that they'll migrate, you know, further North but we've had such strong winds blowing them up into the northern part of the state this year. And there, I talked to my counterpart in Manitoba, and they're also having troubles up in Canada and Manitoba. Okay, one, I guess one final question. Uh, I have family that farms down there by Kindred, and he was mentioning this army worm problem in southeast North Dakota. And he was saying, I don't know if there's, if you could comment on this, but he was thinking that the fields that had prevent plant cover crops on seem to have more armyworms. Yes, the moth is attracted to lodged uh, fields or uh, crops that are real heavy, like a cover crop, like rye, um, for egg laying. So that's why they target those sort of fields. Um, and in in the fields too, you might find it just where the field is lodged, the wheat or barley is lodged, and that's just where the army worms are in that little spot of the field. Uh, but in some cases, the name army um, means they march and move, so they don't really march, but <laughs> they do crawl, and they move out from a certain spot generally in the field as they're feeding. 
So you can f see that spot actually get bigger and bigger. And I was on the phone earlier this morning talking to a grower um, and he was wondering how big the, the area where the army worms were feeding and causing defoliation. They completely defoliated the wheat um, stem. It, only thing left was the head. The flag leaf is gone, no leaves on it, just the stem and the head. Fortunately, they're not clipping. They c can clip the heads. So we're, we're maybe lucky um, those heads will stay on the wheat stem and they'll pupate. So with this hot weather coming in the 90s, um, that's gonna speed up the insect development. So let's hope they pupate and we typically don't see them again. It's just this first generation that comes into the state that's a problem on their crops. Okay, very good. Well, uh, um, glad we could address that. And uh, thank you, Jan, appreciate it. And we really appreciate all the work you do up here with your scouts and, uh, and the work you do. And, you know, we're kind of uh, the disease capital of North Dakota up here and we do have insects and that scouting program is really, really valuable to all of us up here. Well, thank you, Randy. We really appreciate having uh, all the RECs involved because the whole, this way we can cover the whole state of North right. Dakota. Okay, great. Well, with that, then that is our last uh, video. Uh, if any of the speakers want to chime in and make any other last comments, uh, we could do that right now. And if not, uh, again, I would just remind you that all of these videos will be available on our website immediately after this Zoom meeting. And uh, share that with your friends and hopefully uh, uh, you'll be able to revisit them uh, as the growing season goes on. But anyway, uh, thank you very much everybody for attending. Uh, again, we really wish we could have you out here outside looking at our plots. They look wonderful. Uh, feel free to come to the research center and view them uh, by yourselves if you'd like. Uh, other than that, uh, I hope everybody has a great rest of the summer and may our harvest be 100% better than last year. So with that, uh, thank you everybody and I think we'll go ahead and end the meeting.